Hey everybody, I'm Chris White uh, with the American Battlefield Trust. We have Gary Edelman behind the camera and we're still on our western swing and we are out in the Gauley River Valley, uh, actually high above the Gauley River uh, as we are overlooking Kessler's Cross Lanes, Kessler's Cross Roads, or the Battle of Cross Lanes. As you'll come to find out in this area, if you watch our Carnifex, Carnifax, or Carnifix video, there are many different names for what happens out here in western Virginia. Uh, the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes will take place on August 26th, 1861, and it is about two miles from the Carnifex Ferry Battlefield. That battle takes place on September 10th, 1861, Check out our other video that we have for um, Cardifex Ferry. But uh, this battle, which will take place here, is really a, a, uh, a battle in a name, a battle just in a name. Uh, it's more of a large skirmish. Uh, to get you where we, we need to be to talk to you about this, um, on August 22nd, 1861, John Floyd, the former Secretary of War under James Buchanan, uh, the 15th President of the United States, Floyd is going to become a Confederate general. He's going to be sent to Western Virginia. Remember, we're not in West Virginia yet in 1861. This is just Western Virginia. And Floyd will take a force uh, against the better wishes of many other Confederate officers and cross the Gauley River uh, about three miles from where we're standing at a place called Carnifex Ferry. Uh, as he moves about 17 to 1,800 men across Carnifex, he knows that there are Union soldiers in this area. West Virginia at the time of the American Civil War had a number of railroads, the Baltimore and Ohio and the Northwestern Railroad uh, that ran through here. We also had a number of turnpikes, uh, the Northwestern Turnpike, which would go from Winchester to Parkersburg, Virginia, today West Virginia. There's the um, Stanton and Parkersburg Turnpike, the James River and the Kanawha Turnpike. So there's a lot of different roads uh, that come through this area, especially the Gauley uh, River area, which will intersect down around Charleston and down on the Kanawha where the New River and the Gauley River meet to form the Big Kanawha. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, communication lines here. We have transportation lines. How can we get salt? We can go out to the Charleston area. How can we get men up to the Ohio Valley or from the Ohio Valley? We can use these turnpikes and potentially these railroads. So Floyd decides, as West Virginia is still wrestling with what statehood could become, to press across the Gauley and attack the 7th Ohio Infantry that was stationed right where we are standing. We're right beside Zor Church. Gary, if you could just pan off to your right there. Um, this is a, a church founded in 1824, uh, and it sits high above uh, Zor Hill here at Kessler's Cross Lanes. Um, and as you can tell, Gary is much up on the hill. We have hills behind us. Uh, we have hills off to Gary's uh, left. So this is a, an imposing little valley that will eventually lead you off to Carnifex Ferry, which is off to my left, the camera's right, uh, by about three to three and a half miles from where we're standing. So the 7th Ohio Infantry is out here for a reason. Uh, they have been sent out here and they are part of a communication line to keep communications between un two Union generals one named William Rosecrans, who's up around the Clarksburg, West Virginia, Virginia area at the time. And we have Jacob Cox, who's down around the Charleston, Gauley area. So we have little outposts, as it were, 23rd Ohio, which features the two future presidents of William McKinley and Rutherford B. Hayes. You have the 7th Ohio Infantry out here, and you have a few others. So when Floyd gets word that the 7th Ohio is out here, he is going to strike out against them. Now, the 7th Ohio Infantry uh, is an interesting unit. It'll be a three-month, then, uh, then a three-year regiment. They're going to see a lot of action throughout the American Civil War, and this is their first major pitched battle. The 7th Ohio will cross into Western Virginia in May of 1861. Uh, they will make their way down to Grafton, Virginia, uh, which is today Grafton, West Virginia. They're going to find the Virginia Exchange Bank, and they are going to go inside of that bank and take all of the money $30,000 in gold out of that bank. They're not going to keep it. They're going to send it back to Wheeling. Why do we send it back to Wheeling? That is the legitimate, legitimate government of Virginia. That is the West Virginia government starting to create itself. How do we fund it? The 7th Ohio crosses into Grafton, grabs $30,000 in gold, sends it up to Wheeling. Without the 7th West Virginia, you could, or 7th Ohio Infantry, you could argue that the state of West Virginia does not exist because they helped to finance it. Now, the 7th Ohio, um, that money, that $30,000 in gold, if you've ever been to the Trans-Allegheny, what they call the Lunatic Asylum, which is the largest stone, uh, hand stone-cut building on the North American continent, if you've ever been there, 
Um, that is what it was supposed to fund at $30,000. But that $30,000 goes up to Wheeling, and now we have West Virginia. So the 7th Ohio, who is dispatched down here, is under Erasmus Taylor, or Tyler. Tyler is a, a fur trader who knows Western Virginia very well. Uh, and he is going to bring his 7th Ohio down here. A lot of these men are going to be college educated at Oberlin College, very much an abolitionist school in, 18, in the 1850s. Uh, Union General Emory Upton actually matriculated there before he went on to West Point. Uh, so Oberlin College will give us a lot of different uh, uh, graduates, including Ed Helms who is the head of the Dunder, uh, Dunder Mifflin Scranton branch after Michael Scott leaves, if you're an office fan. Uh, so as the 7th Ohio uh, comes down into this area uh, in August of 1861, they're going to be called on some fool's errands. Jacob Cox is going to have them on a wild goose chase. But eventually on August 25th of 61, they're going to be right in this area. Uh, Tyler knows that there are Confederates close by. He doesn't know how many. There have been some skirmishes with some uh, Confederate cavalry, but he's going to spread his men out. Tyler, though he's not a West Point graduate, he has no formal military training, has a good keen eye. Behind me, you might be able to see a crossroads. That is the cross, cross lanes or crossroads. And what Tyler is going to do is, is uh, establish a, a perimeter where we're standing. The bulk of the 7th Ohio, six companies of, of men, will be stationed near where we are. Then he's going to break off four companies, A, C, F, uh, E, and K. And Man. <laughs> yeah, this is getting real nerdy right now. So when he starts to break these guys off, he is going to defend the road to the north, the road coming in from the west, the road to the east, but most importantly, Company K is going to be defending the uh, line coming up from Carnifex Ferry, the Carnifex Ferry Road, as it were. They'll be the first ones to make contact. Tyler, unlike many Union uh, officers or Confederate officers at this time, really believes in drill. And he's drilled his men specifically in skirmish or order. Skirmish order is when you send your guys out into a very thin line, about five yards apart, though it can vary depending on what skirmish manual you use and the terrain that you're working with. And on uh, August 26th, John Floyd is going to bring uh, his force, about 1,700 men, up the road and make contact with Company K. Company K will start to fall back. Right around the area where we're standing, the long roll will be played by the 7th Ohio. The 7th Ohio will start to fall into uh, will start to fall into line. As the 7th Ohio starts to fall into line, companies A and C will start to form right about where we are, right down in this hollow below us. They will start to try to engage with the Confederates who are starting to push from up from Gauley River. The Confederates are going to start to try to get on the hill behind me. They're going to start to try to get on the hill behind Gary. So they're going to start to envelop around this small 7th Ohio force. Below me would have been A and C, companies A and C of the 7th Ohio, commanded uh, at this point by Lieutenant Colonel William Crichton. Crichton's an interesting character. The 7th Ohio, if you know anything about them, are known as the Roosters. The Roosters, uh, they get their nickname from it because Crichton, for whatever reason, decided to get out in front of his men and squawk like a chicken and like a rooster to get his men worked up. There are some other stories that talk about why they're called the Roosters. We're using the Crichton story because I like it the best. If you go to their monument at Gettysburg, placed on Culp's Hill, near the saddle on Culp's Hill, there's a rooster right on their, on their monument. Uh, so you can also see pictures of the men wearing the rooster badge. But A and C try to hold back Floyd's men. They're actually going to march to that next hillside, trying to meet the Confederate threat coming from that direction. But Confederates will start pouring in from this area where we're standing. A and C will halt, they will about face, and they will fire a volley right into the Confederates, saying that they staggered them and fall back to that hillside. More Confederates will keep pushing Company K towards the north. Portions of the 7th Ohio will be pushed off to the west. Some will be pushed off to the east. And really, it's going to be every man for themselves. Now, this battle is known as the Battle of Forks and Knives. And the reason they call it the Battle of Forks and Knives, many of the 7th Ohio were having uh, breakfast at this time. So they talk about coming into camp where these guys are eating their breakfast and the Confederates easily run them off. While this battle might have taken 15 to 20 minutes, according to Tyler, it took 45 minutes. I never believe their watches. The reality of the situation is that the 7th Ohio does put up a fight. They're vastly outnumbered. You know, they, they have about 600 men versus 17 to 1,800 men coming in here, plus the Confederates have cannon. The 7th Ohio will spread out from here and about 132 men will become casualties of the 7th Ohio. 96 of them are captured. 
One portion of nearly 400 men will take a very circuitous route out of here under the uh, third in command whose name's escaping me make it their way down to charleston and they'll hook up with jacob cox a union general around charleston down in the Kanawha valley and amazingly not one man from that command fell to confederate forces from the seventh ohio but after this john floyd who had crossed at gully river has now played his hand he has shown the union forces i'm here on the north side of the gully river and that's going to pull william rosecrans down from clarksburg that's going to pull Jacob Cox in from the Gauley Bridge area, and that'll bring a converging force of more than 7,000 Union soldiers towards Carnifax Ferry, where John Floyd will set up what's called Camp Gauley, and that will set up the Battle of Carnifax Ferry, September 10th, 1861, most notably known for the amount of generals or future generals that will serve there, uh, 20 to 25, depending on whose number you use, at the Battle of Carnifax Ferry. And uh, just want to mention, if you come out the Kessler's Cross Lanes, uh, there are a, a number of signs. If you head down to the fire department, uh, there are two uh, historic signs from the state of uh, West Virginia. If you head down to the old Sunoco station, there's actually a Civil War Trail sign. Gary, I think they have some sort of a, a saying with Civil War Trails. Civil War Trails, there's always something cool to see and do along the trail. So be sure to stop there so you can get a, a good idea of where the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes took place. We're just north of the Carnifex Ferry Battlefield where you can go out, check out the State Park, check out Kessler's Cross Lanes, which is the prelude to the Battle of Carnifex Ferry, which will be a tactical uh, Confederate victory, a strategic Union victory uh, at Carnifex Ferry. So with that, I want to thank you for watching. Please share this with your friends, with your family. Check out our Carnifex Ferry video. Check out all of our videos that we have over at battlefields.org or check out our YouTube channel at American Battlefield Trust over at YouTube. And do check out battlefields.org. Hopefully you'll become a member. Check, click that donate button. Check out all the great things we're doing, not only for land preservation, but for history education. And donors like you have funded this trip, sent us out to where you wanted us to go, and we are at places like Kessler's Cross Lanes because of the generosity of our members. So with that, I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you for watching, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.